Hi, my name is George Sinclair. I'm the lead pastor of Church of the Messiah. It is uh, wonderful that you would like to check out the, some of the sermons done by Church of the Messiah, either by myself or some of the others. Uh, listen, just a couple of things. First of all, would you pray for us uh, that uh, we will uh, open God's word well uh, to his glory and for the good of people like yourself? Uh, the second thing is, um, if you aren't connected to a church and if you are a Christian, we really, I would really like to encourage you to find a, a good local church where they believe the Bible, uh, they preach the gospel, and if you have some trouble finding that, uh, send us an email. Uh, we will do what we can to help connect you uh, with a good local church wherever you are. And um, if you're a non-Christian checking us out, we're really, really, really glad uh, you're doing that. Uh, don't hesitate to send us questions. Uh, it helps me actually to know as I'm preaching, how to deal with the types of things that you're really struggling with. So God bless. For a second, let's bow our heads in prayer. Uh, Father, uh, we thank you that we can be in this place at this time, that it's warm on a very cold night, and uh, we have health and strength to be here. We thank you, Father, for those um, who are online. We, we don't thank you, Father, that if they're ill or some other other thing that forcing them to be home, but for those who are home for all sorts of reasons and joining us online, we thank you, Father, for them as well. And we ask, Father, that your Holy Spirit would fall on all online and all who are gathered here. And Father, bring us into the mystery of Jesus uh, in, his, in his birth. And we ask this in the name of Jesus, your Son and our Savior. Amen. Please be seated. So uh, I didn't, <laughs> I guess I could have looked it up, but I, I never, I didn't know what we were going to be singing uh, in the first, three, the, the first three pieces of music. And uh, Deborah said that it's a, the third piece that she sang to Danny Boy. It probably is unfamiliar to most of you, although it seemed when you got more volume. Uh, but for me, it had a very special resonance, and maybe for my wife and a couple of others. There was this very, very wonderful woman by the name of Franny. I think her last name was Willis. Do I have that right? Franny Willis, and she was part of this church for, I don't know, 10, 12, 15 years. When she came to the church, she was quite elderly, and she had spent 30, 40 years as a missionary um, working uh, to provide a, a, a bookstore, a Christian literature at very low cost, even for free, and working with children in Hong Kong. And she had devoted her entire life, never married, she accumulated nothing in terms of this world's wealth. And she finally got too old uh, that she could do that. And she came uh, back here. She came into our church for a variety of reasons. And she spent most of her last years until she was really incapacitated because she just loved children. And she taught Sunday school and, and would make them all these little special little things. And um, she was a very special person. And every year when we had our carol sing, she'd always choose that that was her thing. She'd always choose that song. So if people had come to the carol sings during that time period, they would have heard that once a year <laughs> in the carol sing when they'd sing it. <clears throat> and um, it's sort of a, just a neat thing in terms of God's providence that we would sing this because, um, and, even, and it would make me think of Franny who would leave, uh, her family was originally from the Shawville area. She'd actually was born in China in mainland China, and her and her older brother, I can't remember if his older or younger brother, and her parents were kicked out by the communists when they, the communists took over China. But she's originally from Shawville, and um, that's where her family roots were, and that's where she lived until she died. And she was a wonderful woman. You know, when we celebrate Christmas here in Ottawa, it's very easy to think of Christmas as just being something that's um, well, we, you know, we think of it as, you know, commercial and gifts and all those things, and they're all, they're all very, very good. But we, we sort of tend to forget that um, Christ, Christmas is celebrated all over the world, that um, you know, we might be not that many here or online, you know, but we have brothers and sisters in Christ who've celebrated Christmas already in Australia, Korea, throughout all of Asia, Indonesia, Asia, Kazakhstan, Europe, sweeping across to us and it'll keep going and people of all races and tribes and languages will celebrate Christmas and not only that but it, it goes down the corridors of time that Christmas has been celebrated by Christians for for centuries and centuries and centuries and centuries 
Uh, one of the things that Daniel Avatan and I decided we would do this year, a little bit different, trying to figure out what text to preach on on Christmas. And uh, there's this thing that not many people know of anymore because it stopped fundamentally being used by most churches sometime in the mid-60s, <clears throat> early 70s, not that long ago. I know that seems like 100 million years ago to young people, but it's not really that long ago. But there was this common system of Bible reading on Sunday mornings that went right back to the 400s and even earlier and was used, it's been used there for, for over 1,600 years. Over 1,600 years it was used. And that means it was used, you know, back in the Roman Empire and then as, the, as, 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 as Christianity spread throughout the entire globe that for 16, over 16 centuries, these would be the scripture passages that churches would read on a Sunday morning when they were, on a, on a morning when they were celebrating Christmas. And, 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 and actually, one of the things which is really cool about it, there were two systems of reading texts. And when Charlemagne became the, the emperor, he picked, the, and, and he wanted to try to unify the empire. So what he did is he picked the epistle readings from one system and the gospel readings from another so that both sides were satisfied and united them together. And, and these two texts, um, it's funny, they, don't, they didn't choose the, the Christmas stories. They chose these two texts which talk about ideas and what the story means, that, are, that these are things are some of the deepest truths that, I mean, they can't even be imagined. You, ju you just have to think about them and ponder them and, and receive them, the deep truths that underline the very, very simple story. I mean, that's one of the things which is so wonderful about Christianity is on one hand, it's stories that children can learn about Jesus walking on water, Jesus feeding the 5,000, uh, Jesus healing the, healing the man born blind, and we can know the diff many of the aspects of the story of his birth, but at the same time, these, these stories are all embedded in these very profound ideas. And we're gonna look very briefly at that this, this evening. But before we do, let's just sort of get the story straight in our head. So uh, we're gonna watch our first mini movie, and it's called The Wrong Christmas. And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you, you will find a king wearing a magnificent crown. No, Dad, that's not it. Oh, really? L let me try it again. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord, and this will be a sign for you. You will find a powerful, well-trained soldier. No, Dad, you did it again. That's not right. Okay, uh, how about this? and this will be a sign for you. You will find a democratically elected president. What? No. A trendy motivational speaker. No way. A big tech CEO. A movie star. Time traveling cyborg. No, no, none of those are right. The shepherds weren't gonna find any of those. Okay then, little Miss Know-It-All. What did they find? For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. Oh, that's right, a baby. Does that even make sense? A, a baby is totally helpless. Yeah, but if Jesus didn't come as a baby, mm -hmm. then he would have known what it was like to grow up. Ah, but wait, why did he have to grow up? That's easy, to save us. Ah, well then that means that the best part about Christmas is... The baby. Right, the baby. Oh, well, I guess it's time you get some sleep. We got a big day ahead of us tomorrow. No, we're not done with the story. Okay, just a little longer. And suddenly, there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying glory to God in the highest and on earth peace. 
peace among those with whom he lives. What's important about the thing that the ancient Christians got so right was that what was most important about Christmas was the baby. Who is the baby? Well, if you have your Bibles, we're going to look a little bit about who that baby is in this very, very sort of abstract way, but actually a way that if you pause on the words, you realize it's touching something very profound in our hearts. And it's in Hebrews 1. And um, if you don't have a Bible with you, the words of the, where the text will be up on the screen. And I'm just going to read the first four verses, and then we're sort of going to circle back. And so here's what the text says. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers, um, it just sort of means ancestors, by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He, that is the son, is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of of his nature. And he, that is the Son, upholds the universe by the word of his power. And after making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. Now, for most of us, I mean, some of it, if you, if you read it slowly, more like poetry, you can see that there's some things in there which are quite, you know, beautiful sounding. But it seems hard to understand, like, what does it mean, the imprint of his nature? And uh, what does it mean to, to talk about him um, being the, uh, the radiance of the glory? And, and um, I mean, these are just sort of odd things. And uh, they don't seem very relevant to us. Well, let, let's go back and let's look to see, just think a little bit more about it. And the first thing to notice is this. Look back at verse 1. Long ago at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our ancestors by the prophets. But in these last days, he, that is God, has spoken to us, that's you and me, by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. This is something very remarkable and very precious, that the God who really does exist is a God who speaks, and he speaks to ordinary people like you and me. And our Jewish friends call what we call the Old Testament the Torah or the Tanakh, and that is the words that God spoke to the people of Israel and to other nations as well. But culminating with all of those words was this final way that God was going to speak to us, He was going to speak to us in a final way in the person of his son. And that just, that means this very person is the guy, the the means by which God would most completely and utterly reveal himself. He's always the same God speaking. And the rest of what we now call the New Testament is either the words of Jesus or just those who knew him helping us to understand what he taught and, and who he said he was. And, um, and, this, and, the, and the fact that he says that God, the same God who speaks is the God who created the world, well, that's actually a very remarkable idea. Maybe if you just watch this video, it'll help you to understand a little bit about just how remarkable this truth is. If we could watch the next video, that would be good. It was that silent night when the stars turned their gaze to marvel at the earth. When the heavens gathered breathless round a lowly stable. When a young mother wept tears of worship, falling on the baby in her arms. And the song of the earth arose in Bethlehem. Soft is the tender beating of his heart. And all was calm, all was bright. 
Yet could this be the same God of Abraham, the conqueror of Israel? This baby, this fragile life. Is this child the one who burned his name in rapture across the gasping skies? Whose voice spoke the oceans into crashing rhythms? Who crafted the mountains into guardians of the firmament? Whose hand ignited the thirst of the deserts and the warring surge of the elemental hosts? Who breathed life from dust? Broke the oppressor's rule? Scattered the chains of his people like sand? And led them through the wilderness with the pillar of flame? Is this child the one whose presence billowed thunderous on Sinai's peak? Who surrounded Job with the roaring wind? Stood defiant in the raging furnace? Wrote judgment against tyrants and blazed on the lips of the prophets? Scorching history's pages with the fury of his might? Could this be the same God who chose to come as the vulnerable king? setting his throne on straw and manger, drawing forth the tears of shepherds, receiving the gifts of wandering travelers, his fame unknown in this world. He is Jesus, the one who thunders through the heavens, yet whispers to our hearts who reigns victorious, yet bows to serve the broken. He is God in the fury, God in the silence. He holds this mystery balanced in his hands, holds our questions till they lose their need, until all we see is him. That's what these simple words are, are trying to very simply communicate that, well, let, let's look at them again. Verse one and two, look, long ago at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our ancestors by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things. Well, what does that mean? Why is he appointed the heir? Well, it's actually a very, very precious idea. It's the idea that this son, well, actually, you know what it is? Uh, we, we Christians believe that uh, there was an Adam and Eve, and, and uh, God had intended us to inherit this earth and to have it turned into a beautiful garden, of a beautiful creation, and who knows? He probably intended us to travel to the farthest reaches of the galaxies to be the, his vice regents and to... Um, to express beauty and creativity and, 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 and the dignity of work. And Adam threw it all away because he wanted to be God himself. And what was supposed to be the inheritance of the entire human race was lost. And so when this text is saying, like, who is the one who is in the cradle? And who is the one who went from the cradle to the grave? He is the one whom God said, God the Father said to his son, will you go and take on to yourself human flesh? Will you be that second Adam? Will you be the one who will accomplish what Adam could not? Would you be the one through whom human beings can once again have an inheritance of one day having a new heaven and a new earth and a place that for all eternity we can develop and beautify and glorify and and maybe even to the farthest reaches of the galaxies. And this word here, heir, is that salvation word that God appointed Jesus to be the one who would be able to inherit all of redeemed creation, all of the redeemed, and our inheritances in him. And then look what it says right after that, because there's seven wonderful things. Through whom also he created the world. And so this son who's spoken of by prophets and has been appointed by God to be the one by which human beings can be reconciled to God and through whom we will have an inheritance of a new heaven and a new earth, the same son is the one who's created all things. He's created 
matter. He's created mind. He's created our souls. He's created all things. And not only is the creator of all things, its next thing here says he is the radiance of the glory of God. And, and that is, it's like, what, what that's trying to capture is what our creeds say when it says that Jesus is light of light or light from light. It's trying to say that, uh, that Jesus is exactly the same nature as God. And then in the very next one, it goes along with it, and the exact imprint of his nature, this is in verse 3, that's trying to capture the same thing when it says in the creed that um, of one nature with the Father. And it's, it's this, this image that's trying to balance the idea of light from light as if, you know, there's just light. And, and, and it could make it think that Jesus and God or the Father are, are, I mean, they're the same in nature, but this other image says they have the same nature, but imprint shows that they, they fit together and, and, and they, they belong together, but there's something which is different there. Just as the, 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 you know, if I was to make an imprint with my hand in some clay, it, it's not going to look, it's, it's going to be different than my hand, but the same as my hand. And, and, and that's what's trying to be captured with this here. It's this very, very powerful idea that God isn't just one, he's three. It, it, you'll, they'll talk about the Holy Spirit later on. And, and, and so the son who is going to, to be the means by which we human beings can enter into an inheritance of grace uh, in, in a new heaven and a new earth that will go on for all eternity, that this, this one who does this is also the creator. He's, he's also the one who's exactly the same nature as God, and yet he's, he's different from God because he's, he's a second person. And, and then it, it, it goes on and, and says that he is the, well, sorry, what does it say here? The, the next thing that it says, that he upholds the universe by the word of his power. And... Um, and this means, and it's not a static image, it's because, you know, the universe is moving, like all of the planets are moving apart, but, but what this is saying is that the same one who left heaven to die for us is the same one who created all things. He's the same one who is, is fully God. He's the same one who sustains and moves the entire created order from, from one moment to the next. And yet, yet he's a man. He's a man. That's what it's trying to, to communicate. If you think about it for a second, it's part of the human nature to pray. Agnostics and atheists pray. Hindus pray. Buddhists pray. Muslims pray. And they pray from their heart. They pray out of their need. They pray even though it might be in many of those cases that their ideas about the nature of the world would say that it's completely ridiculous to pray. But when we pray, we're not praying. We're, we're praying to a God that we believe actually is sustaining the universe and carrying the universe from one moment to another. And because he's sustaining the universe and carrying it from one moment to another, it makes complete and utter sense that we would call out to him when our heart is desperate and we need his help. So the question is, if this God is the creator of all things and the sustainer of all things and is the exact same nature of God, why on earth would he agree to come to earth? Well, this next movie will help us to understand that a little bit better. Why? Why? Why did Jesus come to earth? Why forsake the majesty and fellowship of heaven? Exchanging a palace for a stable immortal comforts for a feeding trough, and robes of glory for the feeble body of an infant. An unparalleled irony, this supreme unrivaled nobility experiencing absolute and total humility. Our sovereign God, 
Emmanuel, as a baby. He didn't come to heap shame upon sinners, or to judge and cast out the impious, but to break bread with those called unrighteous. He didn't come to illuminate every mystery of the cosmos, or to enlighten the intellectual, but to fulfill the testimony of prophets clothed in rags. He didn't come to elevate a single nation, or to advocate a particular political affiliation. He came because he saw you, broken, in need of salvation. He saw you lost and abandoned, crying out, surrounded by deaf ears, fighting through the tears, but beaten down by the torments of this world. And unable to bear your distress, he renounced his eternal throne, walked the earth, bore the stripes, accepted the nails, and gave up his last breath, so that you could receive the breath of life. Our God. Our holy, infinite God. Beheld your pain. Perceived your heart and determined that your soul was worth dying for. From the manger, to the cross, to the empty tomb. It is all a story of profound love, of a savior who rescued his children from darkness. Of a blameless king who declared that no sacrifice was too great for the sake of his beloved creation. Why did Jesus come to earth? He came for you. That's part of the shock that uh, in the cradle is the one who would provide the means and by which we could have an inheritance that that same one in the cradle is the one in the cross, that, that when we see the cradle, we are seeing the creator of all things. When we are seeing the cross, we are seeing the creator of all things. When we see the cradle, we see light of light, God from God. And that's who we see in the cradle, and that's who we see on the cross. And when we look at the cradle, we are seeing the one who is the imprint, the exact same nature of God, and that's who we see dying on the cross. And when we see the cradle, we are seeing the sustainer and mover of all things, and that is who we see on the cross. If you could put up the diagram, as you're gonna be able to see, uh, I have to look at it myself. I, I hired a team of high-priced graphic designers uh, for this illustration. This is a very simple way for you to understand what the book of Hebrews is trying to get across. You have God, and then this very, very solid line, which represents creation. We Christians would call it creation. Another way to, to put it, but it wouldn't fit in here, would be everything else. <laughs> and the question is, on which side of the line does Jesus fall? Does he fall with an everything else, or does he fall on the line above? Actually, if you think about it for a second, this simple little diagram, especially if you take away the word creation and just say everything else. In some ways, it explains the difference of the different religions in the world. In many ways, our Muslim friends, it's all about God. And in a sense, in many ways, it's creation is almost as if it's completely and utterly irrelevant just to God. To our Buddhist and Hindu friends, creation is something which has been a bit of a problem and eventually will be gotten away with and they'll just be God. And for our agnostic and atheist friends, you get rid of the God and you just have everything else without God. But for Christians, we see that there's this very clear thing and the book of Hebrews is trying to communicate it, that there's this God. And on the other side of this, there's creation, which he has made and he sustains. And what this is telling us is that Jesus goes above the line, that one of the reasons we don't agree with Canadians when they say the word God is, I don't know quite what they often mean, but we mean the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, three persons, one God forever and ever. 
And so the shock of this diagram is that this God, on the other side of his creation, that he, in a sense, descends into his creation, which is broken and in pain and needs help and needs salvation and needs deliverance. And God, the Son of God, crosses and sends this line to be the one who will die in creation for his creatures and for all creation. That, that can be seen if you go back to your, our scripture text. Look, look at verse 3 again. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by his word of power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. And, uh, and this talks about that whole journey from the cradle to the grave, the cradle to the cross, that he came to do that, that his entire life and his death on our behalf is the, in fact, in the original language, it's a, a once for all language, that something happened in history once and for all that means that when we plug into it or it plugs into us, that our sins are completely and utterly purified. And it's a very, very profoundly deep image. In, in fact, you see, there's so many things about this. And actually, and then we'll just finish that other thing here. The, and then he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. And majesty is another way of talking about God. And it's this, 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 this provides the image that when Jesus did something once for all on earth that purified human beings from sin, it happened once for all. And he goes to sit at God's right hand because his work was accomplished. He goes to sit at God's right hand because he's there to rule. And he goes to sit at God's right hand because he intercedes for his children and his people, his inheritance. And he sits at God's right hand because he is working all things to their proper end when he will come again and will usher in the new heaven and the new earth. And, and, and so one of the things which is so beautiful about Christianity is when you start to understand it is like in, in, in our day and age, people have to keep on having amnesia. So they, they, they say, oh, well, how did all things come to be? Well, all things came to be through evolution. And, and when we say that, we have amnesia about right and wrong and about the fact that we hope to go to a better place when we die and we think that there's meaning in life. And then when people want to talk about what happens at a funeral, well, we have to have amnesia about, uh, about evolution because we want to believe that we go to a better place when we die. And, and then when we want to talk about justice, and it's so important to talk about justice, we have amnesia about going to a better place when we die, and we have amnesia about evolution because we want to believe that there's an order that transcends things so that it's completely and utterly right for us to say to China, stop persecuting Christians, stop persecuting Muslims. Russia, don't invade Ukraine and use rape and, and, and indiscriminate killing. It's wrong. And, and to go to a, a, a society where there's segregation and racism, we want to be able to say it's wrong. It's not just wrong from our framework. It's wrong. But when we say that, we have to have, have amnesia about we go to a better place when we die and about evo evolution. And Christianity is all about we're the true woke. God wants us to stop having amnesia and wake up and realize there's a creator and a sustainer and a ruler who rules justly and there is an end and he's one. And we don't have to have amnesia. We can use our thirst and quest for justice to think about the beauty of the created order and the beauty of the new heaven and the new earth. And we can think of, we can be awake. And there's this other things which are so powerful about it that, you know, it means that our deepest desire and deepest need, which is to, to be loved, this text is telling us that that deep need is, is met by the true God who truly does exist, that Love is eternal. It goes back before there was even creation. It long predates us. It's higher than us. It's lower than us. It's, it will continue into, into, into the future. And, 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 and the, 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 the need to be purified, that the fact that there are things in my life that 
I'm, I'm ashamed of and, and things which I've done which are just completely and utterly wrong and, and things which I, I think of that, that I hope that nobody ever knows about me and, and, and that Jesus' purification that he's provided for me goes all the way to the moment of my conception, it goes into the very depths of my unconscious, it goes to the heights of my intellect, it, it goes to my future until I die, that this purification which is offered is, is so profoundly deep. <coughs> and it tells me that there's a deep hope that God sustains all things and will bring all things to their proper end and that even though the days can seem very dark and cruel, I'm going to talk a bit tomorrow about, I mean, if you think about it, it's just, there's a type of darkness and evil in human beings that eight young school girls would gather to murder a homeless man. Like that's a deep evil. And unless there's the hope of the gospel and the hope of this, what hope is there? That darkness won't overwhelm the light. But there's a deep hope that the one who redeemed me is the one who created all things, who sustains all things, who rules. And there's a deep humility that he did it all for me, that I'm, I'm deeply loved, but it is a, a love that can't create narcissism. It's humbling. And it's a love that propels the ones who've been gripped by it to make a difference in this world for his glory. And that's what I'd like to leave you with, with this final video. And then I'll ask you to stand and we'll pray. Let's watch the final one. And while they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. She gave birth to her firstborn, a son. And she wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Where does the creator of the universe send his son? Where does the prince of peace make his entrance? A barn, a stable, a, a manger of all places. Certainly no place fit for a king. But then again, this was no ordinary king. The Savior is born in a stable. So there are animals and uh, animal stuff, manure, mud, a pitiful place for a human, much less the King of Kings. So why? Why would he do that? Because the shepherd was coming to care for his sheep, to make a way for his sheep. And, and that's what shepherds do. They live where the sheep are, they eat where they eat, and they sleep where they sleep. And this will be a sign to you. You will find the babe wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. You ever thought about that sign? Sign for what? Maybe it is a sign that Jesus is accessible to everyone. Maybe it's a sign that the God who owns the cattle on a thousand hills can relate to a homeless person, that God will have nothing to do with the social status of mankind. Either way, it's a sign for all of us to go and do likewise. You see, later, Paul would write these words that you should have the same attitude as Jesus Christ, who being in the nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but he humbled himself. He made himself nothing, becoming a servant, coming in human likeness. The creator who had been served since before the dawn of time, stepped out of heaven to become a servant. Who does that? The God who's laid in a manger. A messy feeding trough. Yeah. Why such a messy place? Because he came to save messy people. 
So, that first Christmas was dirty, grimy, filthy. <laughs> it was messy. But thank God it was. Because without it, what a mess we'd be in. I invite, you to, I invite you to stand in closing prayer. Father, we thank you that uh, Jesus set aside his glory and splendor and prerogatives and appearance as God, that he took into himself our human nature, that he entered really truly humanity as a zygote in Mary's womb, that he had a humble birth, that he lived a humble life, that he suffered the trials and temptations that we suffer only without sin, that he was truly Emmanuel, God with us, God among us. And we thank and praise you that he continued his descent, taking into himself, and bearing our sins and our shame and our wrongdoing and paying the penalty of it when he died upon the cross. And we thank and praise you that he tasted all there is to taste of death and that on the third day he rose triumphant over sin and over death and triumphing over all political and all demonic powers in his resurrection. We give you thanks and praise that he ascended into heaven after showing himself alive by many convincing proofs. And we give you thanks and praise that, Father, he is in heaven beside you, that he intercedes for us, that he not only is in heaven interceding for us, but he is still Emmanuel who walks with us day by day as we deal with the things we need to deal with day by day. And we give you thanks and praise that he will come again in glory, that there will be the judging of the living and the dead and that the redeemed will enter into the new heaven and the new earth that will be created by him for us as our home for all eternity. We ask, Father, that you would grip us with this wonderful truth, these wonderful truths of the person of Christ and his wonderful work for us, and that as we are gripped by that, that we will have hope. We will have hope to build and create and to sing, and to work acts of mercy and compassion and justice knowing that, Father, you are our Father in heaven, and this is your world. So grip us with the gospel, grip us with the wonder of who Jesus is and the wonder of his birth for us. And we ask these things in Jesus' name, your Son and our Savior. Amen.